You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 30th, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, non-IgE mediated food allergies. Our presenter is Dr. David Stukas. He's the director of the Food Allergy Treatment Center and a professor of clinical pediatrics at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Okay, well, um, Dr. David Stukas, also Dave, um, is joining us. He's going to be speaking today on non-IgE mediated food allergies. Um, He is an associate professor of pediatrics in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio, and he is the director of the Food Allergy Treatment Center there. Um, He also holds multiple leadership positions in the um, academy and college. And in 2018, uh, Dr. Stukas was invited to become the first social media medical editor for the Quad AI, where he produces and hosts the podcast Conversations from the World of Allergy. So um, we are always very grateful to uh, have you join us. And with that, I'll turn the time over to you. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate the chance to be here again. Um, I love meeting with your group, and uh, I hope that this is uh, an informative discussion. Uh, thanks for mentioning the podcast. If you, if anybody's interested, I had the opportunity to have Peter Hotez on, uh, and we published it Friday, and that was a, a fascinating conversation about uh, an update in regards to all things COVID. So I uh, welcome all feedback related to that as well. All right. Uh, here are my disclosures, which are not relevant to today's talk, and here are our objectives, what we're going to go through today. But I always want to start with just putting it out there of when we see patients in the office, uh, whether it's parents of children or whether it's, you know, adult patients, they often have a lot of common concerns that fall into our expertise. Uh, And I would encourage all of you to spend some time online and uh, put in some common search engine terms and use the common search engines like Google or Yahoo or Bing uh, and just put in the questions of, you know, people are, are infatuated with their digestive tract. Uh, especially when it comes to their child. Are they pooping too much? Are they pooping too little? Why is their poop this color? Why is their poop not this color? Why does it smell like this? So these are common concerns that we hear from a lot of people. And uh, when it comes to the GI tract, that's what we're going to spend most of today talking about. When it comes to any type of food allergy or really allergy in general, uh, the history is the best test, as you all know. What we're really looking for uh, when it comes to immune responses would be reproducible symptoms every single time an allergen is encountered. So we really want to focus We also need to use an understanding of prevalence or pretest probability. What else is in the differential diagnosis? Uh, We really have reached an age of it's it's uh, patient-centered shared decision-making. So even if we don't have all the answers, we should always be discussing options with people. Uh, And then reassessment as well. And then really we want to give individual guidance to each person. And I think it's perfectly fine to say, you know, I'm not really sure exactly what's going on because, as as you all know, there aren't great diagnostic tests for most non-IgE mediated food allergies. So sometimes we're we're left saying, this is my best guess and here's why. Um, Here are our options in order to figure this out and try to make you feel better. And then, of course, a lot of folks, and I tell this to parents all the time, of, of parents and humans are wired. We are wired to try to find causation everywhere in our world. Uh, so when it comes to a child um, and they're having symptoms, that parent, it is in their, it, it, it's just they're hardwired into their brains that they're seeking out cause and effect. Whereas more often than not, what they're actually identifying is correlation and not causation. So we can help them understand these very important differences, especially for those poor mothers who are breastfeeding and they've taken 25 foods out of their diet and they're in tears in our office because they have nothing to eat and their child's no better. I also like to start with definitions with families. Sometimes I'll even you know, lead off with that at the start of a visit. If I know why they're coming in, sometimes I even know that it's unlikely that they have a food allergy, but I still want to help however I can and listen to their concerns. So I'll say, I'm really glad you're here today. I have a sense of why you're here. I'm going to get to a lot of questions and specifics regarding you or your child's care in just a moment. But if it's okay with you, I'd like to start by just, uh, relaying some definitions. And then I talk about how allergy is reproducible and immediate onset food allergy would cause these symptoms. And oftentimes they'll say, oh, I've never had those symptoms before. I've never seen those. You say, okay, good. Well, they don't have, you know, that immediate onset allergy risk for anaphylaxis, but they may have an intolerance. 
or that's more difficult to your digestion, and that would be a specific food. And I always talk about lactose intolerance as the most common example. And then I talk about IgE and its role in food allergy as well as our testing. And oftentimes just kind of sort of setting that stage with some simple definitions it changes the expectations for the entire visit. And then more often than not, they're, they're completely fine with me not doing a bunch of random IgE testing when they have no history that's concerning for IgE-mediated food allergy. I'm going to lead with the references. Um, I haven't seen any better references than these, and I keep checking. Uh, so you're going to see these throughout, but um, take screenshots. or I think I shared my slides already. Um, this is really all you need to know in regards to a great um, understanding of the evidence surrounding non-IgE-mediated food allergy. And I'll talk about some of the practice parameters towards the end of the, uh, today's talk. I do want to lead with... Um, Rethinking some of the paradigms, and this was an interesting review published last year in JAMA Pediatrics that really looked at the cow's milk allergy guidelines, and they found significant um, issues with not only conflict, conflict of interest with the authors, but also sort of the, some of the symptoms that they said may be due to cow's milk allergy. And I, I think this is really important for a few reasons. One, our friends in general pediatrics are well-versed in just saying, you know, if a child has any symptoms or the con if there's concerns, maybe it's milk allergy. It just gets thrown out there, whether it's colic or reflux or sleeping too much, sleeping too little, things like that. And I think there's this just tendency to just change the formula and see how things go. That may be the right answer, but when they use the word milk allergy, that really sets the stage and it, it changes expectations in the parent's mind. And then they think that their child may have a medical condition when it may just be part of the normal human existence as a, as a newborn baby or an infant. Um, and this review really went through and found that there may not be good evidence to support a lot of the guidelines that suggest um, you know, changing uh, cow's milk-based formula that may be due to allergy or things like that. And then we're seeing more um, important, uh, you know, um, opinions and, and evidence surrounding uh, what do breastfeeding mothers do? Because how much actual intact food allergen passes through breast milk after maternal ingestion? Probably very little, but we were, you know, for decades we've been telling mothers to take food out of your diet. Uh, and then oftentimes they take food out of their diet, there's either interval improvement in their child's symptoms or no improvement at all, and then they take more food out of their diet, and they go down the rabbit hole, and they, and they start with milk, and then they go to egg and wheat and peanut, and they read something on Facebook about this other mother who tried this, and then they stop eating things, and their child's no better because it had nothing to do with their maternal diet. And I love, um, from this reference here in Jackie in Practice, published last year, a thoughtful approach is necessary. I really think we need to get away from blanket recommendations to tell all breastfeeding mothers to stop eating foods. And we really want to minimize unnecessary elimination diets. This is an algorithm that they published. I'm not going to go through this, but it really walks through some of the common reasons why moms are told to stop eating certain foods in their diet or they think that they're causing any issues, whether it's immediate symptoms, atopic dermatitis, or GI symptoms. Um, in, in my experience in 15 years of clinical practice, I, really it's been two mothers, two mothers that have absolutely had to remove food from their diet. In both instances, the baby was literally latched onto the breast and they developed anaphylaxis while they were, while they were drinking milk uh, from the mother. And then we were able to tease out which, which allergen that was through skin testing and things like that. But for the vast majority of other mothers, uh, we can find ways to keep food in the diet and then treat the baby's symptoms and kind of go from there. Now, when it comes to non-IgE mediated food allergy, we're going to spend most of our time talking about the gastrointestinal forms of this. Uh, that are listed here, and we'll kind of go through these individually. I won't spend a whole lot of time on celiac disease today. There's a couple of interesting things in, related, in relation to skin that we're going to touch upon as well. And then there's a fun story at the end in regards to Heiner syndrome and pulmonary hemosiderosis. You need to know that more for boards than anything else. All right, so where do we stand with the pathophysiology of non-IgE uh, food allergies? If any of you have figured this out, please let me know, and I will update my slide deck. But as far as I'm aware, we still have a very poor understanding of exactly what's going on for the vast majority of these conditions. Um, it's likely T-cell mediated and other, forms of, other parts of the immune system that are activated, but these are definitely more reproducible upon ingestion. When it comes to trying to diagnose these properly, I, I recommend a consistent approach. And I do this, you know, this is just what I do with every single patient. You know, what's the clinical presentation? We have to start with the story. What are the common foods that can be associated with this condition? What testing may or may not be indicated? Uh, what's the management and then what's the prognosis? So really thinking through likelihoods along all of these realms as well as options can be very helpful. And starting with uh, FPIs, or as you know, food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome, this was an interesting review in international consensus guidelines for management. This has really great information. We're seeing more and more case reports of interesting FPIs to foods that weren't traditionally associated with it. We'll talk about common foods and 
and I'll, I'll in management in a second. But I just want to sort of plant that seed that as we reinforce early introduction of allergenic foods and we're seeing more even, you know, pea-based proteins and things like that, I think we're going to see a bit of a shift in evolution in our understanding of FPIs and some of the more common causes. I, I personally seen um, peanut-induced FPIs, or what we think it is. Um, so I think, you know, we're going to see more of that as we move forward and as we get babies to eat more, more solid foods. As far as the clinical presentation, this really is a condition that presents in infancy. Uh, it can happen early on when they start on formula, three to six months of age, or once they start eating solids a little bit later in infancy. And the most common presentation is the acute form. About one to three hours after ingestion, everything is completely fine, and then out of nowhere, they start puking like crazy. Sometimes they get diarrhea and they get lethargic, uh, and they, it, they can look pretty ill. I just had somebody last week that would, they passed their FPIs challenge to oats, uh, they're two years of age now, but they were hospitalized at six months of age just because they got so dehydrated after uh, severe vomiting, which we thought was due to oat um, at the time. Uh, and they did quite well uh, with their oat challenge this time last week. Uh, there was also a chronic presentation that's described, and this is often very early in infancy. Uh, but, you know, I would just say that we don't have a full understanding of what chronic FPIs really looks like, and this may be other conditions to consider. So it's almost a diagnosis of exclusion uh, when you're considering it, especially since there's no good test available. What are some clues? It's really hard to diagnose it um, just after one episode. I think I, maybe I've done that once in my career, and that was from one of our own uh, allergy nurses that we work with, our lead nurse, actually, and it was her daughter. Uh, it was her grand, grandson, actually, so it was her daughter's son, and it was just classic. Uh, I think it was, you know, with oat or something like that. First time they had oatmeal, they were fine, and then two and a half hours later, just vomiting like crazy. Um, so we talked about risks and benefits of trying and things like that, but we really need to have that reproducible nature to it um, as we would with all types of allergic conditions. They're, they should be well in between acute episodes. We want to make sure that there's no you know, viral gastroenteritis at the cause of it or, or other chronic gastrointestinal uh, problems that's causing repetitive vomiting uh, and really try to rule out other etiologies. Not likely to be FPIs is hard on that first episode uh, or only episode. If their symptoms are really lasting for 24 hours or longer, we need to be thinking about other causes here. And then really, you know, FPIs, they should be fine other than when they eat that specific food or foods. So we shouldn't be seeing failure to thrive um, and, you know, other chronic symptoms that go along with this. As far as diagnostic criteria, there's major and minor criteria. So really you have to have that, you know, that severe vomiting uh, several hours after eating the, the suspected food. Uh, and then you can have minor criteria as well, which would be the second episode, repetitive vomiting after you're trying the food at a different time, if they have extreme lethargy. Uh, and then the, these are just thrown in there like to try to tease out this, the more severe presentations of, of vomiting in infants. So if, and if, if an infant... Uh, um, or maybe a young toddler shows up in the emergency room because of vomiting. That usually, that's an outlier because there's a lot of kids out there that will vomit for a whole bunch of reasons. But if they're sick enough to go to the ED, that they should grab our attention and try to sort through. Is it just viral gastroenteritis? Is it food-induced? And so on and so forth. Common foods, as you all know, are cow's milk and soy. Uh, this will often present early in infancy, and then we're seeing more solid foods. It can be with rice and wheat, oat, egg, vegetables, fruits, poultry, some of the foods that are more non-traditional for IgE, mediated food allergy. Most infants uh, really have FPIs to one food, uh, but you can certainly see it to multiple foods. Um, so we need to keep that on our radar, but as we sort of give them anticipatory guidance and help expand their diet, we need to keep that in mind that for most of them, it's just going to be one food. So we don't necessarily have to be highly conservative when it comes to that. And then really, this shouldn't uh, occur in exclusively breastfed infants. They really need to eat that food uh, to have the symptoms. So the history is the test. We don't have a good diagnostic test available for any real non-IgE-mediated food allergies necessarily. Uh, oftentimes, we'll do trial elimination diets and reintroduction. For us, it's really just having it on your radar. Uh, we opened our new food allergy center, oh boy, five months ago. Uh, so that's all we see. That's all I do now is all day, every day. is just food allergy, food allergy, food allergy. So just with that volume, we're going to pick out the outliers here and there, uh, which is a little different than if you have more of a general practice and you're seeing one patient with allergic rhinitis and there may be immune deficiency and atopoderm and things like that. Uh, but having it on your radar and looking for that story is really helpful. Um, and really, there's you know, no, no need to do patch testing or biopsies or any real laboratory evaluation or anything like that. Um, what's missing is important. So for FPIs, they really shouldn't have associated hives and swelling and rash and itching. Uh, they should have negative IgE testing, although we're seeing a few instances where they may have elevated IgE 
uh, and then have IgE-mediated reactions down the road, but those are probably more coincidental. It's not like f pies will morph into an IgE-mediated food allergy. And there's non-diagnostic abnormalities in the acute setting. They can have an increased white count, thrombocytosis, acidosis, and methemoglobinemia. As far as management, really it's identifying the food and just avoiding it, and they should be fine after that. So if they're avoiding the food and they're still having symptoms, then we should be on the lookout for other diagnoses. And then I give every single family um, a letter. I'll show you an example in a second. The FPIES Foundation has a great template of just saying, hey, if your child does accidentally eat this or develops it to other foods and you have to go to the ER, um, here's a letter that says, my child has FPIES. Here's what's likely causing their symptoms. Epinephrine doesn't work. Uh, and histamines don't work. But also use your clinical judgment because if you think that they're septic, then by all means you should you know, evaluate and treat as such. And then I give almost every family um, some Zofran. I, as a parent, I uh, love having Zofran around for all kinds of reasons, especially when you're on vacation. Um, but uh, I think it's important to have as well because we can hopefully at least uh, lessen the severity of episodes should they occur in the future. And I'm sure you've all seen this. This is just one example. We have um, we use Epic for our EHR, so I just have a whole smart phrase for it, .fpies letter, and I put it in uh, the communication. I can print it out for the families. I can send it to PCP, and it's part of the electronic medical record as well. Now, as far as feeding recommendations, you know, this comes from um, the review, and um, um, Anya, Anya Nowak Wagrins um, is really has led most of the consortiums in regards to FPIs, but I say that with caution only because um, when we look at the cohorts that are used to develop this, some of this does relate to just, you know, her style and, and her colleagues and how they've approached this. So there isn't necessarily a black and white, like you have to do it this way. Mm -hmm. um, but there's guidance. And with all guidelines, I think that's what we should, we should use. It's not, you know, this is absolutely the way you have to do it. It's, hey, this is what, you know, would be a good starting point, but your individual patient that's in front of you may, right now may or may not you know, benefit from a similar approach. Um, so as you can see here, when it comes to milk and soy pies, you really no need to avoid solid foods and things like that, but you may want to consider uh, avoiding either or of the milk or the soy. I talk to each family about their level of risk tolerance. I say, listen, uh, it's probably unlikely they're going to have reactions to other foods. It's in their best interest to expand their diet. Should they have a reaction to another food, now you know what to look for and you have Zofran at home and you can call me and we can reevaluate. But if you're willing to expand their diet to try a bunch of other foods, I think the benefit far outweighs the risk. Um, and most families like that approach. Uh, but you may find some that are a little more conservative. Oh, and they go even further when it comes to like, you know, lower risk foods such as green vegetables or yellow, if they react to yellow vegetables and avoiding those and going to orange and greens and all kinds of other grains and things like that. So I just... I'll refer you back to that reference if you want to take a deeper dive. But here are the questions that, you know, we don't have the answer to. Um, so with IgE-mediated food allergies, I would argue that, you know, there, there's a large cohort of patients with severe peanut allergy that they have a threshold that's even above trace amounts. Or what happens with, with may contain statements uh, or, or foods that say process in the same facility as X, Y, and Z. We know that those pose low risk for if you have anaphylaxis to that food. Well, what's that risk with FPIs? I would propose that it's probably minimal risk for those as well. Uh, same thing with trace amounts and cross-contact. We know with milk and egg allergy, when it comes to IgE, a significant portion of those children can tolerate when you bake it, especially in like a matrix with wheat protein and other things like that. So can the same be achieved with FPIs as well? What about all similar foods? What about, do we, you know, does the cross-reactivity that we understand with IgE-mediated food allergy apply to FPIs? What about when we actually do the oral food challenge? Do we need to admit them to the ICU or infusion clinic and, and uh, establish IV access. Uh, and then what about the role of steroids? We just don't have good evidence to support a lot of these, a lot of these things. The good news is we know that most infants um, will outgrow this as they get older. It's just a matter of when. Uh, we generally say you know, let's give it a good 12 to 18 months since their last known reaction before we challenge it. And that's the only way that we can figure out whether it's gone. Um, some people do advise IgE testing before you re-challenge, especially for cow's milk because of the small case series that we're seeing of, of some infants sort of crossing over, developing that IgE food allergy, but that's not well established either. And then really as far as a criteria for a positive challenge, I'd say, you know, can you get them to eat about a serving of the food? And unlike the, the, the traditional food challenges we do for IgE food allergy where there's risk for acute reaction, I usually will give, you know, say 10 to 20 percent of what our goal um, right up front. And then I'll wait 20 minutes just to make sure nothing weird happens and then give them the rest. And then they just hang out. 
And when they're successful and nothing happens, I mean, they're just bored out of their minds and they're ready to go. Uh, and I talk to each family about, you know, do we need to watch it for four hours, six hours? I usually say three to four hours. And then even if a reaction does occur as kids get older, it's generally less severe than their initial presentation as well. Uh, we don't uh, get, you know, established IV access at our institution. Um, we do have an emergency room in, in our facility, so that's very helpful should we ever need to uh, establish that. And we also don't check blood testing, but there are some parameters that you, if you do establish IV access and do blood work during an acute episode, then this would uh, suggest a positive challenge. I just look to see if they puke. Um, so that's FPIs. I'm going to take tons of questions at the end. If it's okay with you, I'll kind of just keep going through, uh, and then uh, we, can, we can chat about everything. So let's move on to food protein-induced allergic proctocolitis. This is something I'm seeing more and more of. It, it's funny, like we opened our doors and the floodgates opened, so like every infant that has any type of feeding issue we're seeing, which I love. Uh, but I'm seeing this a lot more now than I have you know, earlier in my career, just probably from a volume standpoint. Now, this is typically going to be very early in infancy, in the first few months of life. And this is a happy baby. They're fine. And a parent changes the diaper and they say, oh, my God, they're bleeding out of their, their rectum. What's going on here? Um, it can occur in breastfed infants as well. Uh, they may have some colic and gassiness. But, again, they're not going to have failure to thrive. We're not going to meet them in the ICU with this diagnosis. Sorry if you're eating lunch or breakfast right now. This is a great example of, of what the diaper looks like. Um, common foods would be cow's milk or soy. Uh, it's very rare with extensively hydrolyzed formulas, uh, but it can occur with breastfed infants. At least has been described. Um, so uh, this, I think this also falls into that realm of a lot of this evidence is sort of not very strong and goes back to what was initially reported, you know, 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, it was just taught through the decades, and we keep saying these same things over and over again. Uh, so I would recommend caution if you, if you experience this in ex exclusively breastfed infant, but it's been described as such. Ig testing should be negative, and then you really aren't going to have many abnormalities. As far as management, it's you know clinical diagnosis. Uh, so you go with the likelihood, and then take the food out of the diet. I always, always, always recommend waiting 72 hours. Um, if parents are told we're going to change them from cow's milk to soy or cow's milk to elemental formula, and the next diaper change they still have blood in their stool, which they should until they heal, um, they are going to. Um, you know, really uh, freak out about that. So we need to, you know, counsel them and anticipate that and say, listen, this is going to take several days. So let's let's commit to this and take it one step at a time because the vast majority, you can just switch to soy milk formula and they should do okay. Um, they may need some nutritional monitoring support if they are unable to tolerate that. Uh, and then rarely do we need to go all the way to amino acid formulas. This is a self-limited condition. The prognosis is extremely favorable. Uh, if you look through the literature, actually, most infants are, it's resolved within a couple of months. Um, but, you know, for the most part, we generally recommend avoiding dairy until they're 12 months of age, more for the iron deficiency anemia and, and poor absorption from, a, from drinking cow's milk. But they can certainly try expanding other types of dairy in their diet uh, if they're, once they're eating solid foods and everything's resolved. Uh, and then we just reintroduce without any testing. I still get referrals a couple times a year. Go see the allergist before we give them, you know, let them eat dairy again. But we don't need to do that. We can just, you know, take it, use our understanding of the pathophysiology to let them feed again. When it comes to food um, uh, protein enteropathy, now these children are very sick. So, you know, if we think about significant involvement of the gastrointestinal tract, typically it's going to be onset in the first couple months of life, almost always in the first nine months. Uh, severe diarrhea, more than half will have failure to thrive, and they can look pretty sick. We typically are going to meet them in a hospital setting. As far as common foods, cow's milk formula, you can see it with other foods as well. At least it's been described as such. Um, but it really should not occur in exclusively breastfed infants. IgE tests should be negative again. Uh, the biopsies are going to show nonspecific findings and just from all the damage that's being done uh, and then nonspecific abnormalities like malabsorption, anemia, and then um, low albumin and protein as well. As far as management, it's uh, high index of suspicion, diagnosis of exclusion, making sure we're not missing any other causes for that, and then elimination of the diet. It's going to take several weeks because all that healing has to occur inside the gut. Um, and it can take several months before you actually see complete resolution of it. So lots of monitoring, lots of support. And then really, the majority of them, it just goes away. It, this is a poorly understood phenomenon, and we can just feed it again when they get a little bit older. Uh, and then almost all of them have complete resolution by the time they're, you know, um, toddlers. Um, when we think about just the, the impact on the gastrointestinal tract, this was a, a cool review from last year. Uh, and I love this just schematic when thinking through food protein-induced allergic proctocolitis. That's the, the last part of the intestines. Food protein enteropathy, that's more the middle part of the intestines. And then with FPIs, frankly, we have no idea. Um, so they just kind of cover everything. Um, but I just included that in case you want to read that review. 
All right. Differential diagnosis, as you know, it's pretty large. Uh, is there acute or chronic infection of some sort? Uh, you know, as allergists, we're going to diagnose uh, giardia uh, every once in a while. We're going to diagnose some weird parasitic infections if we have a higher index of suspicion. But I would say, um, in some respects, make them earn that diagnosis. So the vast majority of kids um, that we, or the you know, infants that we, or ta- I should say children that we evaluate, um, aren't going to have these weird, weird esoteric things. But it's up to us to have that on our radar as well. Uh, and then just kind of going through looking for obvious ab- anatomic abnormalities, inflammatory bowel disease. We're going to share a lot of these patients with our gastrointestinal colleagues uh, and other specialists as well. Okay, so moving on to eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease. Uh, The most common form of this would be eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, We, again, don't have a great understanding, but, you know, it's Th2 pathway cytokines that we know that are involved, uh, and we're seeing it increasingly recognized with increasing prevalence. Uh, It does seem to affect males more than females, and there isn't a genetic component to it as well. Uh, This was a cool schematic that I included from, you know, this is now six years old, uh, but it just kind of walks through some of the the better understanding of some of the genetic predisposition as well as the foods that may be involved in causing um, irritation of the esophagus and inflammation and things like that. Although there's recent um, uh, speculation that this may be more of like a um, barrier disorder, not necessarily inflammatory disorder, similar to asthma. Uh, I think there's great arguments, and I love the pro-con debates of, is this a barrier disorder or an inflammatory disorder, and which came first, the chicken or the egg? As far as the clinical presentation for eosinophilic esophagitis, uh, in children, um, it's more often than not chronic abdominal pain. They can have nausea, vomiting, sometimes failure to thrive. And in adults, it's usually more heartburn or GERD symptoms. Sometimes they do get the solid food dysphagia. And then in severe cases, they get the impaction and strictures. So I'm sure you've all seen these patients uh, where they get, you know, they're seen in the ER and they get sent to us. And you know, oh, yeah, you had to go to the emergency room to have that food removed uh, endoscopically. And, you know, that's uh, high on our radar. I apologize if you hear a buzzing. Uh, yes, I'm uh, privileged enough to have cleaners in my house right now. Uh, so they're vacuuming the floors right above me, but they should be done in just a moment. Yeah, uh, that's where we are, right? Zooming from home. Um, common foods in eosinophilic esophagitis, think milk, milk, milk. That's you know the, the culprit in um, more than half of all cases if we're going to look at food elimination. Uh, also, wheat and gluten or egg. And then uh, international guidelines were updated just a few years ago, um, and there was a, a, a conference where everybody kind of got together, and they agreed upon a couple of things. One is you have to have symptoms, so really asymptomatic disease is, is, should be considered non-existent when it comes to eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, so what are the symptoms that they have that sort of led the investigation in the first place? What do the biopsies show? You have to have evidence of elevated eosinophils. Um, ideally in a couple of spots. So they should be taking biopsies from multiple spots throughout the esophagus. Um, what it should be isolated the esophagus. If you're finding eosinophils lower in the gastrointestinal tract, then that rules out eosinophilic esophagitis and you think about other forms of EGID. Uh, and really, you know, making sure that there's no other causes for those eosinophils to be there. And we'll talk about that in a moment. As far as endoscopy, oftentimes it's normal, especially in children, uh, but certainly if you see some of these um, findings, it, it is very strong, uh, it should give strong consideration for EOE, especially if you have the rings or the furrows or exudates, um, but you don't have to have that, so that's why I want to tell, uh, and I think people are well-versed in this now when they do biopsies, even if it looks normal, take multiple biopsies from all, all three points in the esophagus to, to make sure we evaluate thoroughly. And that's what I just mentioned there. So um, we do recommend going lower if they can, if they can tolerate it, uh, just to make sure we're not seeing any eosinophils in the lower gastrointestinal tract as well. And then just because you have elevated eosinophils does not mean you have EOE. Um, My first faculty position was at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. This was, I don't know, 15 years ago. Um, And I loved working there. But for some reason, the ear, nose, and throat specialists, when they were taking out tonsils, they wanted to take biopsies from the esophagus. So they were removing tonsils for whatever clinical indication that was, and they were just biopsying all these kids, and they were sending them from us. And a lot of these kids just said, you know, eosinophil counts of 12 or 15 or 18 or things like that, and then completely asymptomatic from that standpoint. Uh, So we had to have a chat with them and and stop that practice. Uh, There are a lot of conditions that can cause eosinophils to hone to the esophagus. Uh, Obviously, uh, if you have eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease, uh, they can be there from reflux and just nonspecific uh, inflammation, uh, achalasia, if you have hyper eosinophilic syndrome, of course. Inflammatory bowel disease is something that we all need to keep in, in our minds as well. Uh, if you're finding eosinophils throughout the GI tract, autoimmune conditions, vasculitis, or drug reactions as well. 
Now, as far as management, this really is the um, epitome of shared decision-making. This is not one-size-fits-all. There is no cookie-cutter. If you have EOE, you have to do it this way. Uh, there's really limitations in head-to-head -head approaches for this. Um, and, you know, when you look at the studies, we know, we know enough about EOE. There's such heterogeneity, kind of like asthma, that there's probably subtypes of EOE. Uh, and if we apply one treatment approach to a certain subtype, it's probably not going to benefit them as much as it would another subtype. But really the hallmarks are uh, consideration for dietary elimination, uh, PPI therapy, and then corticosteroids. Um, this is a, goes back from that review uh, from New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago. Uh, there's six food eliminations, four food eliminations, allergy testing base, and then we have PPIs, and then the swallowed uh, glucocorticoids. I know we're seeing more um, versions of that um, being readily available as well. Now, as far as the approach to dietary therapy, I really recommend make it evidence-based and practical. Uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense to say you have EOE, you need to stop eating these six foods, have a nice life. Um, they're not going to, our patients aren't going to like that answer very much. But I think we, we should have the conversation and say uh, mm -hmm. there may be some benefit if we take certain foods out of your diet. It's hard to follow, uh, so we need to consider quality of life, we need to consider adherence as well, uh, and really why are we doing this? Are we doing it just to do it, um, or what's the benefit? And then we also need to discuss the rules of medication therapy as well. So none of these decisions sort of live in a vacuum. It's like right now when we're trying to talk about the discussion of should you get the COVID vaccine or not. The question isn't is the COVID vaccine risky or safe. The question is what's the risk and benefit of the COVID vaccine versus me getting COVID in real life. So a similar conversation should be taking place with these patients as well. What's the risk and benefit from dietary elimination versus medical management or vice versa. Um, if we take you know, all foods out of the diet, most people get better. Uh, <laughs> but that's not sustainable. I mean, we're talking about feeding tubes and, and uh, you know, things like that and stop eating foods. Um, and then you can do a six-food elimination diet, a four-food or a two-food. Those are all roughly comparable. Or you can just start with milk and talk about the risks and benefits of if we take milk out of your diet, can we see some improvement? And if not, uh, then we visit other foods and things like that. As far as the prognosis, it really is variable based upon their age, of presentation, the heterogeneity of their symptoms, the severity of their symptoms, their, their findings. Uh, we do strongly recommend that everybody be followed long term. Uh, this really shouldn't be, oh, you have EOE, take milk out of your diet, have a nice life. It really should be, let's come up with a plan together using shared decision making. Let's reevaluate that in two months, four months, six months, and kind of go from there. And then I think it's still relatively controversial. Some people say you have to repeat that endoscopy and get the biopsies, otherwise you have no idea whether there's any improvement. Others would say if they have true severe symptoms on a regular basis and you do an intervention and the symptoms improve, we can use that as a guide and skip the biopsies because every time we go in and try to biopsy, you know, that's an intervention and, and you know, potential for complications as well. Uh, plus, it's a real pain for patients to have to do that repeatedly. So, uh, it's not really, it's, it's set and forget it, one size fits all. It should be this conversation and hopefully working well with the, the gastroenterologist um, that's helping co-management as well. Um, we had uh, we published our latest practice parameters in conjunction with the American Gastroenterological uh, that's a, a mouthful Gastroenterological Association, uh, and we published these last year. Um, and this was a very different approach. This was a grade approach, and what the grade approach does is we took specific questions and we did a systematic review to really look at the literature to try to address each of those questions. I'll show you what that means in a second, and then we really you know. Um, grade the strength of the evidence as well as recommendations. And so there's recommendations that are either strong or conditional, and these are meant for both the patient and the clinician. Uh, so for like strong recommendations, you say, look, most people would want this, but not everybody would. There may be considerations when you wouldn't. Conditional recommendations, the evidence doesn't really point us in one direction or another. Uh, there's, you know, these are thoughts, but many people would avoid that. And then the same thing for a clinician. So again, when it comes to any guideline that you're reading, uh, it really is just that, a guideline. That patient in front of you is not a research trial participant. They are a patient. They may not even fit into the guidelines that are established for whatever reason. Uh, so I think it's a good starting point, but it doesn't mean we have to do it for everybody. Um, then we have different levels of confidence. We have very, you know, very confident, moderately confident, limited confidence, and then very little confidence as well. So let's go through if we look at you know, some of the different recommendations and questions. So first recommendation, patients with symptomatic or esophageal eosinophilia, um, the Joint Task Force suggests using proton pump inhibition over no treatment. 
it's a conditional strength. So we, we would all recommend this. There's probably very little risk to it. Um, but the evidence isn't that great. Um, so what does exist would favor that, but it doesn't mean that everybody would benefit from that. We know that there's some that are PPI unresponsive forms of EOE as well. So this is sort of a catch-all. Um, that individual patient may not fall in there. Number two, in patients with EOE, the Joint Task Force recommends topical glucocorticosteroids over no treatment. Now, this is uh, much stronger evidence. So we know that, you know, steroids make eosinophils go bye-bye, uh, and it makes a lot of sense, and we know that with eosinophilic esophagitis especially. Number three, in patients with EOE, they suggest topical glucocorticoids rather than oral. Uh, again, there's no head-to-head -head studies looking at this, um, so it's a conditional statement, but we know that we're going to, you know, still have side effects or potential for side effects from topical glucocorticoids, uh, but they're much less than what we get from oral glucocorticoids. Number four, in patients with EOE, uh, the Joint Task Force suggests using elemental diet over no treatment. And you see the comment. Patients who put a higher value on avoiding the challenges of adherence to an elemental diet, it's like a word, like a word salad there, right? And the prolonged process of dietary instruction may reasonably decline this treatment option. Right. So, again, I showed you if you take food out of the diet, almost everybody gets better. But, again, our patient's going to want that. Um, so this is where sort of these recommendations come into play. Number five. Um, in patients with EOE, the task force suggests an empiric six-food elimination over no treatment. Again, the six-food elimination diet seems to work fairly well uh, for most people involved in these trials, but, it, but would that patient in front of you actually want that as a therapy? Same thing looking at allergy testing-based elimination diet. Um, so the evidence doesn't really support our standard use of IgE skin prick or blood tests to, you know, find those foods that would go along with EOE. You know, we didn't, we don't have many diagnostic tools for non-IgE mediated food allergies, so it makes sense that people started looking at the value of specific IgEs in evaluation of EOE, uh, but this goes back 15 years, and we find that it's not an IgE mediated disease, so more often than not, you just have very atopic people, uh, and you probably are getting more false positives than anything. So is it helpful if it's negative? Potentially. Is it helpful as evident, if it's elevated, potentially? Um, so I, I, I encourage each of you to you know, approach this using your understanding of the evidence. Uh, but for the most part, we really stop doing you know, large panels of te testing for dozens of foods for the patients that we're seeing with EOE a long time ago. Number seven, what if they go into remission? Uh, it, and a suggestion for continuation of topical glucocorticoids over discontinuation treatment. So the concern would be, what about long-term ramifications? So... Um, do we need to continue the, the um, swallowed uh, steroids for long term? And this would be, you know, do they put a high value on avoiding any side effects versus any potential complications? So it's up to them to help, you know, we can help steer that conversation of risks and benefits. Side effects from, you know, taking the swallowed steroids versus side effects from not. Uh, if that patient who had severe impaction, they may want to do everything they possibly can to try to prevent that in the future whereas the patient with candidiasis may want to do everything they can to prevent that in the future. And there's other, there are other questions as well that look to things like omalizumab and montelukas that has very little evidence to support its role. So really, where do we come to when it comes to EOE? I, I think it, it has to go to that shared decision-making approach, and we, we can you know, discuss the options with those patients that are in front of us. We can discuss specific choices about how we're going to approach those, and then most importantly, reassess it. Let's come up with a game plan together. Um, I encourage all of us to really not focus on the outcome. I think we need to focus on the decision-making process because if we're comfortable with the decision-making process and that patient's comfortable with it, if they have a bad outcome, we still came to a good decision. If they have a good outcome, sometimes that blinds us and we, all of our biases come into play. So a bad outcome would say, oh, I knew I should have done the other thing. Good outcome, nobody ever goes back and says, aha, uh -huh, I knew I was contemplating choosing the other path, but I'm glad I didn't. Nobody ever does that. They just focus on the outcome. So let's focus on the decision-making process, put a plan in place, reassess. If things aren't going well, you come up with a new plan. All right, we're going to shift gears as we finish the last few minutes here. Uh, so we'll go to the skin conditions associated with non-IgE food allergy. Um, I'm ready to rename our food allergy center the Allergic Contact Dermatitis Center of America. Uh, I walk into rooms all day, every day, and every single child looks the same. Uh, they often will have fair skin, strawberry blonde or blonde hair, and blue eyes. Uh, and they have a parent who has a history of sensitive skin and chronic rashes. And then we get the story that uh, when foods touch their skin, they break out in a rash. Uh, so it can be from more of a contact dermatitis or it could be from a nonspecific uh, irritant dermatitis as well. But we know there's a long list of foods that can cause these symptoms. Typical story is food touches the skin, um, and um, I get a rash in that area. But otherwise, 
uh, the child is happy, not having generalized urticaria, carry, not having anaphylaxis, things like that. Um, and then in subsets of patients, there are some more um, prevailing uh, causes of it, especially hidden sources of it. Uh, you can get that local inflammatory response. And then in very rare cases, uh, systemic ingestion of things with, you know, if you have a nickel contact dermatitis and you're eating foods high in nickel or foods that are uh, canned foods and things like that where they give us more nickel, um, you know, there, there's case reports and case series that this can cause more systemic manifestations. But I would say those truly are the most severe of the most severe. And the vast majority of people aren't going to have to follow a nickel-free diet if you diagnose them with nickel contact dermatitis. Other considerations, I mentioned the irritant contact dermatitis. Contact urticaria can occur as well. Um, I had the, the craziest food challenge a, a month ago as a child with um, presumed a milk allergy, but their history was contact or to carry with milk, and their specific IGs were super low, and they were about two by the time I challenged them. This was a call, a patient, uh, the patient was a, from a colleague of mine. So during the challenge, we, we just started drinking some milk. The first step, they spilled the milk on their wrist, and they broke out in pretty significant urticaria. And, you know, I knew the specific IG was like 0.87 or something like that. And I thought, man, I had the conversation. But this is, this is concerning. Like, they're clearly having a reaction from where it touched their skin, but they were otherwise acting fine. And we decided to move forward. And lo and behold, they were able to ingest a ton of dairy. And they, they did great through ingestion, but they had that contact urticaria from the milk. So we decided to keep it in the diet. And if they break out and, you know, urticaria wherever it touches the skin, that that's not, that's not worrisome and they're probably at low risk for anaphylaxis. So those patients exist out there. And then these more rare uh, complications like photoallergic or phototoxic contact dermatitis. Uh, there's just some great examples of, of um, different types of these um, allergic dermatitis you can get a lot of peak times in food handlers. Uh, whether it's chefs or uh, you know people who work in the restaurant industry or maybe even cooking at home, uh, some of the fruits and some of these will have shared homology with some of the plant proteins that can cause pollen allergies and things like that. Um, and so these are the examples of how it may present. Now we do have patch testing available uh, that we can use for a lot of different foods to see if that may help guide us when it comes to a contact dermatitis. Um, and then really management is just trying to identify what it may be, uh, discuss risks uh, associated with ongoing ingestion. So some, sometimes people don't need to completely eliminate ingestion of it, uh, but it's more of a skin reaction. Um, and then really, if you have suspected systemic reactions, which would be quite, quite rare, uh, the only way to often tell aside from past testing would be strict elimination from the diet, see if symptoms completely resolve, and then reintroduce again. When it comes to the systemic, the really balsam of Peru and nickel are the two foods most associated with this, at least best described, um, and um, these can be found in a, a wide variety of different foods. So I don't know if you'll ever see these patients, uh, but it's something to kind of keep in mind. I would say this would be pretty rare in pediatrics. And then lastly, we're going to get to the uh, potential respiratory complications of non-IgE food allergies. So this was a, a headline from the New York Times, uh, 1997, so uh, a little ways ago. Infants lung bleeding trace to toxic mold. Have any of you ever evaluated a patient because they've been told that they have toxic mold syndrome or they suspect they do um, or black mold um, toxicity or things like that? So a lot of this traces back to these reports. And this was actually a subset of infants in Cleveland. And what happened was um, in the early to mid 90s, uh, there were infants that were developing these respiratory um, symptoms and, and cough and, and dyspnea and respiratory distress, and they were found to have pulmonary hemorrhage or hemosiderosis. And if you in, investigators went in to try to figure out was there some environmental component or, or things like that, and a lot of these infants had um, evidence of mold inside their homes. And then, they, and of course, black mold, as you know, is caused, is caused by stachybotrys. Uh, so this was the MMWR. Um, and um, um, it, in the year 2000, the CDC went back in and they said, all that stuff about toxic mold that you've been hearing for the last three years, the evidence doesn't actually support that. Well, um, you know, the horse is out of the barn by that point. So uh, after those initial reports, then toxic mold sort of took hold after that. I believe Ed McMahon, who I'm sure a lot of you know, or if you don't know, he was uh, Johnny Carson's uh, MC uh, from The Tonight Show. Ed McMahon's dog, I believe, died, uh, and they blamed toxic mold on that. There was actress Brittany Murphy who um, passed away unexpectedly for unknown reasons. Um, this was maybe 10 years ago, and they blamed toxic mold. Uh, you can go online and look at the Mold Treatment Centers of America that will do all kinds of, you know, 
uh, chelation therapy and they'll do all this evaluation and this is a whole sub industry of contractors and others going into your home and measuring and saying you have toxic levels of mold here so I just wanted to give you the origins and the backstory of this but what this likely was was a very rare condition called pulmonary hemosiderosis or Heiner syndrome um, it's very uh, younger infants and toddlers and all of them have the same story of they were fed cow's milk formula from birth chronic respiratory symptoms, pulmonary infiltrates, and then they have these high precipitating antibodies to cow's milk. And then you, you take milk out of the diet and they get better. Uh, this is a very rare condition. I've never seen this, or, and uh, I don't know if you ever will or not, uh, but this is what was described from that. So that kind of wraps up, um, and I'm happy to take any questions, but in, as we sort of um, come to a conclusion here, I, I also want to plant the seed. We talked a lot about shared decision-making. We talked a lot about how it's not one size fits all, no cookie cutter approach. But when it comes to a lot of these patients with non-IgE mediated food allergies, I think it really does take a team. Uh, so we have our primary care uh, focus, uh, you know, and, and the patient's always at the center of this as well. But oftentimes we're going to be involved from allergy immunology, uh, gastroenterology is involved, and then we need to have a good relationship with our nutritionists and dietitians as well. Uh, and then sometimes it does get to, you know, if they require emergency room care for whatever reason or if they require it you know, further services uh, for feeding disorders and things like that. Um, we may need to get psychology involved or occupational therapy and things along those lines. So these can be complicated patients, um, especially since we don't have a great test that says yes or no, that's what this is. Uh, but high index of suspicion and just understanding likelihoods and uh, pathophysiology can go a long way. And I'll conclude with this. So this was the, the New England Journal Medicine Journal Watch on that review that I showed you at the beginning about the cow's milk allergy. And I love this comment. While it's easy to blame reflux colic rash on cow's milk allergy, overdiagnosis may lead to unnecessarily restrictive diets that discourage breastfeeding mothers or prompt the use of expensive specialized formulas. Um, and they, their comment was that, you know, those findings will make them reconsider before recommending exclusionary diets to breastfeeding mothers. So I hope that this takes hold. I think that there's a lot of overdiagnosis of quote-unquote cow's milk allergy being done, especially in the primary care world. So... Uh, well, if you get the opportunity to, uh, to evaluate these patients or give talks of your own, um, I encourage you to include this sort of information when you're talking to general pediatricians and at least plant that seed and say, you know, there, our understanding of this has really evolved and maybe a lot of these infants don't have cow's milk allergy like we, like we thought they once did. Here's our summary. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen if that's okay. Thank you, Dr. Stukas. We appreciate your um, presentation today. Any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute. Um, there was a little comment in the chat earlier that says your podcast is awesome. <laughs> Had to make sure you heard that. You're the person who listened. I appreciate it. Well, I, I have one um, while well, other people may be thinking. So I've heard it. I've heard people say that there's um, – potentially a little bit of evidence out there to suggest that if you avoid a food um, for an extended period of time that you could develop a IgE mediated food allergy to that food. So in situations like um, EOE where maybe a food is taken out of the diet for a long time or um, even um, you know some of the other non-IgE mediated um, food um, disorders that you talked about where we would avoid a food for a certain period of time and then bring it back into the diet. So just curious, is, is there much evidence or any good evidence out there to really suggest um, that we're putting patients at risk by avoiding foods for a certain period of time? Yeah, that's a great question. The evidence is strongest in infants with atopic dermatitis. Um, and, you know, I think it's, I hope it's well established at this point that it, it, you know, we know that there's a lot of falsely elevated IgE, specific IgE results in infants with atopic derm because they have very elevated IgEs overall. But if you take a baby with, with atopic derm and they're eating the food and you do IgE testing and then you take the food out of their diet, you are the one potentially putting them at risk to develop IgE food allergy. So if they eat the food without acute onset symptoms, they are tolerating that food even though they're sensitized. Uh, if you take it out of the diet, a lot, you know, there's a, a proportion of those kids that will go on to develop those reactions. So we can cause harm by doing that. Uh, it's another thing we want to counsel our, our general um, pediatrician friends about as well. But as far as EOE and other conditions, I haven't seen good evidence that shows that we're putting them at risk. Um, I, 
know, it's a good question. If anybody else out there on the call has, has seen good evidence, please let us know and let's talk about that. But, um, you know, the way I think about it is, it's a really scary proposition that if we take food out of the diet, anybody can then develop allergy to it. I don't believe that's how allergy works, especially once you've re established you know, you're older in childhood or, or uh, adolescent or an adult. Uh, it's kind of like if, for those of you who watch The Walking Dead, right? What's the secret? Everybody's already infected. And then when they die, that's when they turn into zombies. Um, so that's a really scary proposition that we're all allergic and then if we stop eating it, that's, we're ticking time bombs and we develop allergy. And I think, fortunately, it just doesn't work that way for the vast majority of people. Awesome. Thank you. And I got to work in a zombie analogy. Even better. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Stukas, one um, a question I had also um, in regards to eosinophilic esophagitis was that um, if you have a patient that's on chronic topical steroids, um, do you manage as far as like comp potential complications of long-term, um, like, like DEXA scans, things like that? Yeah, great question. I think you have to consider that. Um, yeah, I think it dep everybody's different, right? What, what does long-term in include and uh, what age are they and what are the potential risks, what other comorbid conditions they have? But I think that we're even seeing that now with, um, you know, asthma medications. Uh, I, I, we need to all be aware of that. If we're going to be involved in prescribing or co-managing these medications, then yes, we, we should be keeping that on our radar. Uh, whether it's DEXA scans or just, you know, monitoring the growth chart or who knows what, I think it, it just varies by each individual. But uh, yes, I'm glad you brought that up. I think we need to be responsible for that. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to hang out, but um, if there's no other questions, that's fine as well. I, I really hope that we all get the chance to be together in person sometime soon. Or, you know, the college meeting in New Orleans, for a lot of reasons, is looking like it's in jeopardy. I'm, I'm no longer on the planning committee, so I don't know exactly what's happening with it. I know right now it's they're hoping for in-person or virtual option, but uh, they're being devastated right now, unfortunately, with the hurricane as well. So we shall see. But at some point in the future, I hope to see all of you again uh, in person. and. Um, I hope everybody stays safe. Thanks so much. Have a good one. All right. Thank you, everybody.